Good evening and welcome to International House and to the University and to this very special program. My name is Denise Jorgens. I'm the director of International House here at the University of Chicago. International House of Chicago is part of a network of 19 houses on four continents. The mission of International Houses Worldwide is to enable students and scholars from around the world to live and learn together in a diverse community that builds lifelong qualities of leadership, respect, and friendship. Here at International House of Chicago, this mission is achieved by daily interaction among our students, through our unique facilities and community life activities, and through our internationally focused public programs designed to foster diversity of thought and experience. This evening's program is one of over 200 programs held at International House of Chicago and around the world. And now I'd like to introduce Professor Gary Tubb, the Anupama and Guru Ramakrishnan Professor of South Asian Languages and Civilizations here at the University of Chicago. Professor Tubb will begin our program and introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Denise. It's uh, always a pleasure to be here in the International House Assembly Room and uh, gratifying to see that International House, in its uh, role as uh, host to the world, has, has once again demonstrated its uh, collaborative diplomacy by uh, being involved in helping to bring to us um, a series of activities that uh, are uh, also sponsored by uh, several other uh, uh, interesting friends. And so I'd like to begin just by mentioning with gratitude a few of these uh, sponsors who include, along with International House, the Global Voices Program, UChicago Presents, the University of Chicago Department of Music, the Committee on Southern Asian Studies, South Asian Music Ensemble, Eye on India, UChicago Chicago South Asian Students Association, and Southern Asia at Chicago. I'd especially like to mention that the, pro the series of events is supported in part by the Berendra K. and Anila Sinha Fund for Indian Performing Arts at International House. Of course, it's no surprise that uh, so many interesting groups would welcome association with someone who's as multi-talented as the uh, speaker that we'll hear tonight. Uh, T.M. Krishna is a preeminent vocalist in the Carnatic tradition. Uh, his approach to music is excitingly original, deeply expressive and innovative, while also clearly traditional and well-informed in the history and potential of the Carnatic style. As a public intellectual, T.M. Krishna speaks and writes about issues that affect the human condition and about matters uh, uh, of cultural importance. He's been an influential force in organizations involved in a wide range of musical and societal concerns. He has co-authored Voices Within, Carnatic Music, Passing on an Inheritance, which is a book dedicated to the greats of Carnatic music. His path-breaking book, a Southern Music, The Carnatic Story, published by HarperCollins in 2013, was a first of its kind philosophical, aesthetic, and sociopolitical exploration of Carnatic music. For this, he was awarded the 2014 Tata Literature Award for the best first book in the nonfiction category. T.M. Krishna has been active in organizing and inspiring a number of artistic and cultural initiatives, collaborative activities, and performances, and has been honored with important awards in India in recognition of, to mention just a few accomplishments, quote, his forceful commitment as artist and advocate to art's power to heal India's deep social divisions. End quote. And also his services in promoting and preserving national integration in the country. And his efforts to connect Carnatic music with the common man. 
And if I may uh, paraphrase, um, his success in helping to shake the tradition loose from some of its snootier associations and tendencies. His new book, Reshaping Art, published by Aleph Book Company, asks important questions about how art is made, performed, and disseminated, and addresses crucial issues of caste, class, and gender within society while exploring the contours of democracy, culture, and learning. His lecture tonight, entitled The Role and Responsibility of Artists to Right-Wing Nationalism and Social Religious Conflict, is the culmination of two very busy days here at the University of Chicago filled with performances, discussions, workshops, and other events, including a stunningly enjoyable concert last night at the Logan Center for the Arts. Throughout this generous and illuminating schedule, the one negative note that I've heard is the worry expressed by some onlookers that visitors from India might find our current weather uncomfortably cold. And so I would now ask all of you to help remedy this problem by giving a very warm welcome to uh, tonight's speaker, T.M. Krishna. Professor, thank you for such a wonderful introduction. And I must confess that the last three days were the coldest I've had in the last five weeks in the United States. So uh, Chicago has welcomed me in its traditional style. Uh, I must first say that it's been um, truly an honor and a pleasure to spend two days here um, at uh, Chicago and with many friends and many new friends, and uh, the conversations have been invigorating. Um, the performance was important because it, it also allowed me to uh, frame a concert in a way that was different and speak about that framing in a certain um, very clear way, which sometimes is the subtext, but very rarely do you make the subtext, the explanation. And it was good, I think, even for me to allow that to happen, and in terms of my own understandings of uh, the things I do. So I thank you for uh, allowing me to explore that too. Um, today's, uh, I prefer to call it a conversation rather than a lecture, though you may not be speaking. Uh, um, today's conversation is, of course, without doubt, based on what we see across the world uh, in terms of a certain religious conservatism, uh, elitism, all embedded in certain monolithic notions of culture, of people, of identities, of ownership, of power. Um, my conversation today will be primarily embedded in the Indian scenario, but I'm pretty certain that uh, once you shift the context, it probably functions everywhere across the world, and I'm 100% sure it functions in the United States of America. I sometimes wonder which is the worst place to be, India or America, and I've not made up my mind as yet, uh, because I think we're both going through very, very difficult times in terms of what we seek from the idea of our land. Let me first begin with, well, I'm, I'm a musician. I sing, that's what I do. And anything I say or anything I think comes from that window that that music offers me, uh, the idea that music offers me. Whether it's correct or not is not the, the conversation. But the fact is that it is something that comes from an experience which I believe is at least honest in this experience. And it's going to keep moving. And therefore, let me first start with the idea of art experience. And I think that's the closest to my, uh, my heart. You know, when we speak about art and its role, but what does art do to you, is the question. What does art do to me? And I think if all of us reflect upon the moments when we were in art, those moments which we could call indescribable at some level, the moments where maybe all other cons concerns kind of disappear, the politics of it, the society of it, what exactly happens to us? What are we undergoing? What is so 
profound about it. Is there anything profound about it? Or is it completely culturally conditioned happening? Is it just something that you create for yourself to feel more comfortable about who you are? Or is there something that really uniquely beautiful happens when art happens? I would like to believe, yes, there is something unique that happens. And in those moments, we experience in a way that I would like to call, I'd like to say is detached. And the detachment is the detachment from your own self of who you are. Am I male? Am I upper caste? Am I white? Am I African American? These things, these things, at least during those momentary phases, seem to suddenly just disappear. The characters on the screen disappear. The, the complications of the music disappear. The identities of the melodies disappear. But there is still an experience. And that's the most fascinating part about art. That when it actually happens, there's an experience, but there's no definition to all the different coordinates during the experience. You may do it a few seconds later, and our mind does it very fast. But during the actual event, there's nothing happening. But there's so much happening. What is so special about it? And that's my start point to this conversation. In those moments, I think there is this incredible vulnerability. I would call it a beautiful vulnerability that we undergo. And in that vulnerability, we are not judging, we are not defining, we are not bracketing, we are not recognizing patterns and identifying. We will do it soon, of course we will, we are human beings. But we experience something that moves us. So if I go by this rather very beautiful explanation of what art does to us, whether it's a film, or whether it's a poem, whether it is a, uh, an essay, or whether it is a piece of music. We should believe that music is transcending, or art is transcending. And uh, it should some way cross all boundaries and borders. But I think there is one other thing that those experiences do to us, which we maybe miss, and we, I, I think we do it subconsciously. Because in those few moments, we are not what we are after those few moments. The, mo the moment that passes, we are back to exactly where we are. We've already decided who is good, who is bad, who needs to be marginalized, whose voice should be heard, who should not be heard. All that comes back very fast. But if we can reflect about those moments and just think, why cannot I carry forward in my life a little tiny element of that which happened during that moment of art? Maybe we'll be having a different kind of conversation in society. And fundamentally, maybe we will learn to listen, which is what I think most of us lack. I think the most beautiful thing about art is it allows you to see the ugly. And we refuse to see the ugly. And that's what we go back to being ugly. I know this is a generalization, but I think you, you get what I'm trying to say. If this is all true, then art should, like we say, art doesn't have boundaries. Art unifies people. Art brings people together. Is it really true that it does all this? I believe it's actually a whole load of nonsense. Because art really doesn't, in, uh, really by itself does nothing. It just caters to the kind of set of people that the artist delivered to, and we are satisfied by what we get, and we have this whole contractual relationship, and we are very happy. So if you ask me as a musician, what does making art mean to me? What does it mean to create art, or create an, or sing, for example? There are many answers I can give you. One of the answers, it's a beautiful way for me to reiterate who I am. It's a wonderful way for us to feel wonderful about each other. Um, it's also a way for me to display this idea of my identity. Could be geographical, could be specific, could be male, could be caste, could be anything. But all these are being displayed. 
but that's not why I should be making art. Because if I truly am making art, then I must see the conflict that exists between the context of the art and the experience of the art. It isn't the tension that exists between the context and the experience that art really happens. If I cannot recognize that every piece of art happens with a lot of ugliness surrounding it, and if I cannot recognize that I need to challenge every element of that ugliness, if I want to really, really understand art, then art truly does not happen. It may still be pretty, it may still be enjoyable, but those are different points. It is in this context that I think today's environment of right-wing nationalism in India, a very, very majoritarian Hindu nationalism, which is taking over public discourse in India, and actually is taking over public discourse in India. Everybody else is only reacting. If you actually look at it in India, everybody else is reacting. This is mainstream discourse. In this context, it's very important for an artist to reflect about this fundamental idea of the experience which we love to call profound, and the context which is nothing but nothing profound context which is very, very disturbing. So but what is this? As an artist, what, how, what is this nationalism? What is this idea of the national? If you look at any form of nationalism, it is the first thing it does very quickly is it establishes the idea of the insider and the outsider. The first thing it does, a unifying nationalistic idea means somebody belongs and somebody does not belong. And both these people know exactly who the other is. Those lines are drawn. And within the idea of the belonging, you create an idea of culture. Nationalism actually is a cultural mechanism. Whether it's ideology, whether it is economy, whether it is language, whether it is food habits, whether it is music, whether it is dance, whether it is beliefs, all this is then brought together to mean one thing, one body, one idea of Indian culture. You know, I find it fascinating we talk about Indian culture. There is no Indian culture. There are Indian cultures in plural. What is Indian culture? But we keep saying Indian culture. I say it, but what am I talking about? But that's the whole idea of nationalism. It convinces everybody there's something called Indian culture. It's convinced me. The idea to completely narrow down the, the whole notion of the land, I like to call it a land rather than a country or a nation. The idea of the land is completely constricted the idea of this oneness. Oneness is, the idea of oneness is itself a sanitizing notion. The idea of diversity that's going to contest each other is the reality of a land. But nationalism makes sure that that will not be there. It makes sure that there is this bulk that is created as being the national idea. And then every other cultural form struggles to then, okay, can I fit into this idea in some fashion possible? And if you cannot fit into that idea, then you're either removed or you're marginalized. Or we do we'll go one step better. We appropriate quite beautifully. We appropriate into the idea of the national the idea of the, the power syndromes and make that the notion of India. Let me give an example from forms that I understand, Carnatic music, Hindustani music, and what we call Bharatanatyam. If you look at what happened to Carnatic music post about 1857, 1857 seems to be quite a marker in Indian history. Um, and if you look at how Carnatic music evolved itself aesthetically and socially, you would recognize that it was part of a very similar Hindu nationalistic agenda. I will give you some snippets of it because this is a long story. During, until about the late 19th century, Carnatic music was practiced by primarily two, you could say, three communities. The Brahmins, the Devadasis, and for those who don't know Devadasis, Devadasis were an artistic community of women 
who were connected to the temples in which they were dedicated to the, to the deity, to the Lord. They were considered to be married to the Lord from a childhood. And they were part of the ritual traditions of the temple. They were dancers, they were musicians. And um, they were also, of course, performing in the courts or in the homes, in the places where the zamindars were. These, this community has, has a long history in South India's cultural artistic sphere. The other community that was part of this are the Isevarlalas, and the Devadasi Isevarlalas were pretty much one set. And they used to play primarily two instruments, the Nadaswaram, played in temples, and the Tavala, two-sided drum. They were also percussionists for the dance of the Devadasis. They were also the Natvanars, or the people who kept the symbols for the Devadasis. And they also married within the communities. So you must understand that all women from, Devadasi, from the Devadasi community were not necessarily attached to the temple. There were some who were, some who weren't. Now, it is this triangular relationship. And at those times, the Devadasis were creme de la creme of, of society. They were, they were really important in elements of the cultural capital of what you could call Carnatic music. And then what was called Sadir. Sadir was what the Devadasis danced. Now, if you look at the late 19th century, that's when the national movement, the independence movement, took off. And along with this came this great urge to also proclaim oneself as being this old country. Of course, in India, old is important. And old means at least 2,000, nothing short of 2,000. And this antique culture, and this culture was pristine, this culture that was, in a way, almost at some level considered perfect, if I may say that. There were aberrations, of course, but those we will not talk about. But the culture that was then muddled with by the Mughals and the, and the Muslims who came into the country, and then, of course, messed up completely by the British who came later. And it was important at that time for the powerful Hindu community, which was the upper caste community, to then reclaim this past. And this happened both in North India and South India, by the way. It's not just a Southern Indian happening. Now, in this whole need to find this old culture that could say that we have all this, we have this incredible land, the community that took control of this discourse was a community that believed in a certain idea of living, a community that believed in a certain moral code. And the most important thing was the moral code. So in this, the Devadasis are stuck in between. These women are, have always been attached to temples, but and they were always being also exploited by upper caste men. And then you had the British there, you had, of course, no doubt of it, the Victorian ideas also coming into play, but all this is a mixture of many things happening. Hindu nationalism, Victorianism, the idea that, that these women, um, you know, the rights of these women, and I must tell you, interestingly, the men in the community were very happy that the women in the community lost power. The, when, the men in this, the Devadasi community were very happy because they didn't have any control of the economy of their community. These women were holding the fort. And so when slowly but steadily there was this huge outcry that these women, this whole Devadasi system has to be abolished. Of course, Muttalakshmi Reddy is one of the most important people in that whole process. So the Devadasi system is challenged. It is broken down. And they say these women cannot be attached to these temples. But what happens as a result of that? A very important movement does not take into consideration what these women do, which is they were artists, they were dancers and musicians. So while there, the social complexity was being challenged, nobody cared about the fact is where are they going to sing, where are they going to dance, what's the avenue for these women? None of the men who abused these women were ever questioned. These women, slowly but steadily, are just slowly removed from the whole conversation of Carnatic music. And at the same time, you see Tyagaraja emerging as the most important figure in Carnatic music. 
Chagraja is an 18th, 19th century composer, most important for the Carnatic form. And Tyagaraja emerges as this emblem of purity, the emblem of attaining moksha. The, every characteristic that an upper caste Brahmin looks for is there in Tyagaraja. And Tyagaraja is embraced wholeheartedly in this whole thing. You have Tyagaraja emerging here, and you have the Devadasi slowly being removed from the conversation there. This is a moral code, it's entirely a moral code. By the way, this is right-wing politics. This is right-wing politics. And the Devadasis are slowly but steadily removed. Their art is taught to Brahmins. The dance is taught to Brahmin women. And then the Brahmins tell you they're saving the art. So the discourse there is about if you didn't have these Brahmins coming up there, Sadhir would have died. But nobody said, suppose you had worked with the community and made sure this community remained as an artistic community, Sadhur wouldn't have died. Nobody discusses that. So you have a person called Krishnayar, the Music Academy, everybody coming there and saying, let's save Bharatanatyam. And they started calling it Bharatanatyam. That's very interesting. The word Sadhur becomes stigmatized because the word Sadhur means you're connecting with Devadasis who by then are reduced to prostitutes in their understanding. The Tamil word is Tevadiyal for a prostitute. The actual word is Devar Adiyal. The one who is at the feet or surrendered to the Lord becomes Tevadiyal even today, meaning prostitute. Now this shift is a very important shift for us to understand because this completely transforms the identity and nature of art of these, these women. Apparently, the Nadasura Vidwanas, they are struggling. So what happens with them? They are like, oh, okay, these women are losing power. Let's not fight this too much, because then we will get power. Okay, but they don't realize there's another complication happening here. The music is slowly but steadily becoming more controlled by the Brahmin community. That's a reality. It also moves from the villages across South India to urban centers where Madras then becomes a very important center. And the first off the blocks in this trans, in this movement are upper caste. They are Brahmin or they are Mudalyars or Chetiyars. Again, those who could easily move from there to here. So in this, what I'm trying to say is, in this whole movement, this is right-wing politics being played. And in this is where we are creating the idea of Indian culture. The idea of Indian culture was created even before we got independence. We already defined that this is Indian culture. So Tyagaraja is Indian culture. Carnatic music is Indian culture. And let me tell you, Hindustani music and Bharatanatyam is Indian culture. Sadhir is not Indian culture. Sadhir cannot be Indian culture because it's not pure. And this is entirely an idea of upper caste Hindu thought processes. We can't ever deny this. It's undeniable. Now, in Hindustani music, a similar thing is happening. You have Bhatkande and you have Paluskar. Now, these two are very interesting characters. So, Bhatkande is a fascinating man. He is a musicologist. He says, he basically says that these Gharana musicians basically Muslims. So, there the battle, there the target is a different target, right? Again, because he's searching for purity. Here the target is on the basis of caste and gender. There the target is based on religion. Caste comes through, but it comes through in a slightly different way. I won't go there. I'm going to find the theory of Indian classical music, and I'm going to create a national theory for it. And everybody told him, if you want to find real theory, of course, the intellectualism of India lies in the Tamil Bhavan. I mean, we are really like the intellectual capital of the country, OK? Just, just look around in North America, and you'll see it, <laughs> including your own university, by the way. So, and the, the Tamil Brahmin, so he comes all the way to the south. It's a fascinating document. He's written it all down, by the way. You can read this in Marathi. It's in Hindi. Anybody who reads Marathi or Hindi, please go read it. So he comes to the south and he meets this incredible musicologist called Subramadikshita. Dikshitar. Everybody tells him, go meet this man. He's the only guy who can find, get you all the theorization. And he, there is these long discussions on what is the Sangeet Ratnakara saying? What, what does that mean? I mean, are you singing the music that's close to Sangeet? And finally, it's this illusion because he figures that nobody is singing any music that's connected to Sangeet Ratnakara. 
ಸಾಧನ ಕರ ಅಟ್ ಲೀಸ್ಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಕಮ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಟ್ ರಿಯಲೈಸೇಷನ್ ಸೊ ದೆನ್ ಹೀ ಹಿ ಡಿಸೈಡ್ಸ್ ಒನ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ ಹಿ ಹೇಟ್ಸ್ ದ ಸೌಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಕರ್ನಾಟಕ ಮ್ಯೂಸಿಕ್ in fact he even describes it i'll tell you he says carnatic music is all about ya 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 that's exactly what is written by the way that's his words not mine and he says so what i need is a national musical form that is theoretically based on the brains of the brahmins but musically based on north indian music so the sound should be like us but the intellectual capital must be from there so then he takes from subrahma dikshit there this book called the chaturdandi prakashika and he takes it and decides the whole thought system by the way in hindustani music came from the idea of the chaturnadi prakashika which he took from subrahma dikshit and i am very happy to say that hindustani music did not follow the thought system because a ridiculous system and i i we are thankful to hindustani musicians for having really realize that you cannot do that categorization and with great um, sadness i'm saying in south india we didn't have did not have that reflection and we are stuck with this thing called the melakarta system if only we could break that down but that's another story for another day so you have this happening and then you have paluskar okay he's a different man he is a man of bhakti paluskar says we have to unite india in bhajan and bhakti now do you realize i'm only discussing right wing politics what am i discussing here this again idea of national majoritarian hindu identity being established as your culture this search for this anchor that we can say is from the north south east west of this country and then but paluskar then do you know that the fact that bhajans came into hindustani concert was because of paluskar First of all, Hindustani music is kind of a very liquid term. We should not be using because Khyal is different from Dhrupad, Dhrupal is different from Thumri, Thumri is from Dadra. But now we have a blanket name. But the blanket name is also a way of creating a national pan-national identity, right? And also, the you know who was singing Thumri is not in the conversation. All these things, right? Who sings Dhrupad? Who's you know all these are very complex issues. So then, Paluskar, he is very powerful. He is you know. he has connections in the congress party um, and uh, therefore then he says bhakti music bhajans have to come in actually he was far more successful than bhatkande in his establishment he establishes the gandharva mahavidyalayas okay and he establishes it everywhere i'll tell you the i'll i'll just go across time and tell you if you look at hindustani classical music today it's fascinating that most singers are upper caste maharashtrian brahmins that's a very important idea and where does it come from it's the establishment of paluskar and gandharva mahavidyalaya and the power centers of pune and mumbai instrumental music still remains among the muslim musicians to large extent they are not geographically mainly from here they are from elsewhere bihar kolkata so then you, you there is a huge shift in the vocal that happens 40 50 years later by the way but the effect is an interesting effect all this is a conversation on culture on the identity of the country which by the way independent india adopted long stock and barrel whether it was the congress in power whether it was the janata in power it didn't matter we all bought into this we all bought into the idea that this is india during the 70s and the I think it was the 80s when india had this india festival across the world i think it was called uh, festival of india sorry correction just look at the festival of india they were just representative of this in 80s this is 40 years later and these were the people who were fighting this kind of identity politics but then culturally you accept this i'll give you a, a very interesting experience i have many times so i meet with in courts liberals and we talking politics we talking we are in agreement with everything of course we always talk in echo chambers so we will be in agreement and yes i agree that you know uh, discrimination everything we agree upon and then in the conversation somewhere i'll bring musical experience or art experience it is fascinating how when it comes to that there'll be a but in experience they will suddenly say you know what have i said and done you know to hindustani music you know the what i feel through that i agree all these art forms are lovely but you know because emotionally and in their experience they are not able to see the problem in what they are saying 
they're not at least willing to problematize the fact that their experience is conditioned by something else, which is exactly the things they fight politically and socially. But when it comes to art, they will say, you know, I love whatever you're saying, but you know, Carnatic music, whatever said and done is more complicated than all of the art forms. You know, you know, these are, they're all lovely, I can watch it, but you know, never spending any time in immersing oneself in another idea. And therefore, in this, in this whole story, we have to first accept that when, though I say right-wing nationalism in a present-day context, it is the foundational basis of society. It is an accepted notion of society that we have all accepted, whether it, and it's true across the world, the parameters are different, that's all. We've all accepted it, we've all internalized it. So we may speak politics, but within our experience, we are still playing this little, little game of identity. And we're not willing to accept that that's why we have to start thinking. To put it very bluntly, I think the Indian social fabric has in its core what I would call the RSS DNA. Um, and I'm putting it absolutely bluntly. And I think that includes every person who criticizes the RSS today. And I have it in my, my thinking. I'll be the first person to accept it. I do have it. I may disagree with their caste politics, I mean, but somewhere within me as a person of upper caste, I do think in that fashion. And I'm only, I want to say I'm not speaking for anybody else's voice. It's very important. I'm speaking from my own problematized state. I will not speak for anybody else. Now, this idea of nationalism is fundamentally a default setting to further social and religious conflict. There's no other way you can look at it. There's no way a, a, a nationalistic agenda is going to be about pe bringing people together. Though that's the notion that is thrown at us. Because the very notion is about bringing certain people together and telling the rest, you better be like me. So the whole idea of nationalism, which is cultural, is never going to, never going to enable any conversation. And we have to also concede that it taps into what is fundamentally human. And the fundamental nature of all of us, and we were talking about this morning, is about power, control, patterning, slotting, and recognizing. Gender is probably the first way we categorized ourselves. And then it just goes on in concentric circles. Race, ethnicity, religion, caste, everything. All these are ways in which we negotiate power. We negotiate control. And nationalism and this kind of a notion taps into that fundamental nature of us. Now, as I say this, there is a contradiction. And the contradiction happens when I go back to the idea of musical or artistic experience. If this is my fundamental nature, if at all it is, then what happens to me during the experience? How am I going to reconcile these two things? And that, I think, is the first question that I ask as an artist in the environment that I belong in. How do I reconcile these two contradictions? Let me speak from personal experience. When I started talking about the social conflicts within the Carnatic form, or within my world, which is the Brahmin world, I'm still singing Carnatic music. My audience is still the same. Uh, we enjoy each other's presence. So how does one negotiate that space? I still sing in all the traditional venues where Carnatic music happens. And there is an experience that is happening over there, which is not just profound and musical, and I'll, it is also caste community driven. And then I'm also saying that's a problem. How does one deal with that? Is it hypocrisy? Am I being entirely hypocritical by saying, oh, this is nonsense, but again, singing for them every day? I came to the United States. I sang basically for Mylapur. And for those who know what Mylapur, Mylapur is um, a little suburb of, of the city of Chennai, but it's also emblematic of the control of upper caste. 
okay? And I can tell you, Indians in North America take it way ahead. Um, or should I say way back? I don't know which one is actually accurate. But, so what am I doing? So that's, for me, the first internal question as a musician, as an artist, is what do I do to this? And if I think this is important, what am I protecting? What am I protecting? What am I holding on to as being something that I need to protect, I need to save, I need to say it's not lost, and all these things that I tell myself are important. But it also depends on which part of society I am in to have this conversation, right? It depends on my caste, depends on the art form. And I think it's important here to understand that multiple art forms deal with society differently. And I want to say that here, is the word art sometimes, you know, is too generic to really understand what I could call art intention. Now, the intention of various art forms are varied. You take what you could call political music, social music, then it's directly to hope for political change or social change. The messages are right there in front of you. And aesthetically, I'll tell you, mostly these songs will have tunes that are repeatable, that all of you can sing, right? This is not very different, by the way. So the, I want to tell you, the, tell the commies that the music that they sing is very similar to religious music because the intention is exactly the same. It's ideologically driven on both sides. So aesthetically, it'll be simple that everybody can sing together. So there's some conversion process or immersion process, whichever way you want to look at it, happening on both sides. So if you look at religious music, tunes are simple. Everybody has to sing it together. You take ideological music, tunes are simple, repeated. So the words are the prominence. So the intention is very different. If I take, say, a form like full music, that's a complex area. So, what is the role, especially in Indian cinema, where song dance is integrally part of the experience of cinema? What is the role of music? Ideally speaking, and I say it ideally speaking, the role is to be part of the narrative that is being said. It's enhancing the emotional experience of what is being said, or the storyline, or the script, and the screenplay. Hopefully, okay? Um, or, in fact, could be also an intervention in the, in the story. Sometimes the, strong, the song comes in there to actually shift entire gear of the story being told, right? So in a way, if cinema didn't exist, cinema music does not exist. So there it is part of an idea of storytelling of a very different kind. What happens in Carnatic music? And this is something that I struggle with, like yesterday's concert. Is it the role of, of Carnatic music to say those political things, to say those social things? Or am I shifting with all my philosophical ramblings? I, I will hold that aside and I'll come back to it. So if you look at the music that I sing, I do believe that I'm not here to directly change society. I don't need to sing songs that have political or social context. And at some level, I'm, it's an abstract relationship between what is the text, between the idea of the raga and the idea of rhythm, the idea of melody and rhythm. And in this confluence of these three things and the movements that these things, three things go through, there is art being created. But then why do I sing a concert called classical protest? Because it's important for me to recognize, this is something we started this morning with, with Chalapati, so I'm bringing it here. It's important for me to recognize, this is something that I came upon later, that even to get to the abstract, and which is hopefully a way of, shall we say, muting all the differentiations, you have to use the literal and subvert the literal. If I don't subvert the literal, which is what you get out of Carnatic music as being a certain religious, certain spiritual, certain ritualistic experience, if I don't find ways to subvert that in the person listening to it, and these are all challenges to exactly the right-wing politics, if I don't find a way to subvert it and say, I will sing about a Dalit farmer, 
and i will also sing about rama and i love rama to contest himself with dalit farmer i will sing one song that says i'm a believer another song says that religion is rubbish and i love the two ideas to contest and if you find profundity in both these ideas musically then there's something interesting happening in the experience hopefully so as an artist you have to struggle with this idea but then i come from an art form that ha- that allows me this space but then let me look at the, the push back that happens when something like this happens right the push back happens from you must understand that most classical environments in the world are environments that pressure a certain dominant right wing idea this is across the globe because they are inhabited by people of cultural power whether it is white whether it is upper caste and by the way they are all men by the way that's an understood baseline so they are all men and so the, the level of the idea of machismo the idea of masculinity all these things are part of it right part of this whole build up so when you inhabit this world and you get a push back why do i get a push back push back comes from this tremendous fear a lot of people let me also recognize who believe in that kind of a dominant politics are not bad people you know they are not some evil beings who are there to destroy the country no they truly believe it they truly believe they fear that my actions are going to destroy something that is precious they protecting something you know they they're taking care of something the question is first what are they protecting what are they trying to save so i i will come back to north america for an example so you, i meet a lot of families here and they always are in this urge to protect something for their children you know somehow you have to protect something that my child will not have because i would in they didn't grow up in india and therefore in that mostly carnatic music bharatanatyam could be veda class could be what is that bal vihar right uh, there are a lot of indians here am i getting it right yeah. okay bal vihar all these are ways of fi- protecting something right this this whole idea that they need to be immersed in indian culture and we know what this indian culture is i have already defined it before so i'm not going back this will not be a discourse on dalit conflict in india this will not be a discourse on say what happens in terms of untouchability in india the fact that manuel scavengers are still part of indian societal structure that's not what balavihar is going to be teaching you balavihar is going to be telling you that the gita says this we are so pristine we are so pure we are so wonderful now after all this and first of all these children are fighting a battle often two identities one within one when they open the door and get in their home and second when they close the door and get out of the home and there is this two worlds which is which is like sometimes colliding sometimes ununderstood we don't you know it, there's a lot of complexity there and then these children go about and do what they do there is no balavihar there is nothing actually that has been saved but they still the parents are still worried so recently a friend told me this uh, incident there was this uh, this whole issue about carnatic musicians singing on jesus christ or on allah which which was just what preceded my tour to the united states of america and um, a concert of mine was cancelled in washington dc because i made a proclamation that i will sing a song on allah and jesus christ every month as a response to this this rather very uh, oppressive uh, push that came and a friend was telling me that he was at a at a wedding a wedding where um this um, i don't know it's a boy or the girl who was from upper caste brahmin community was marrying a, a catholic from puerto rico and then you had people attending that wedding and one person sitting next to said you know this tm krishna he is you can't sing on jesus christ you know how can he sing on jesus christ i mean it's absolutely wrong and sitting at this wedding where between roman catholic and a brahmin and that wedding they're having this conversation the fascinating thing is the contradiction is not seen i think that's something we should recognize it's not enough to point at that but the fact is the contradiction is not seen or the very fact that the hindu temple here was built in a christian country the contradiction is not seen but this is what right wing politics does to the thinking 
it embedded itself in a fear that something is being lost. And the more and more they, they push that idea that you're going to lose it. It's going. It's going. And who's going to take it away? The Muslims are going to take it away. Who else is going to take it away? All these Dalit movements are going to take it away. And they, sh they scare the shit out of people. And this is what everybody does across the world. Now, which is why you would always find in India, especially, I can speak for India, is that any kind of protest, whether it was the communist or the, or the Dravidian movement or any of the, of the movements that were actually against an hegemony, used the music of the lower caste as their, as their avenue. If you even go to the communist movement, you will find theater and music from the lower caste community being part of it. The Dravidian movements, even the songs that they sing, of course Dravidian movement also used cinema, but that's a, another story. But if you go to their thing, the kind of, they use the instruments that come from that caste. So inherently there's another division here. The division is that the art forms of the marginalized have always been part of the process of questioning always challenged status quo. But the art forms that belong to the idea of national identity very rarely engage in that because they do not believe there's anything to challenge. If at all, they are always intimidated by the fact that somebody is challenging it. So, you have, if you take just art, you have, as artists from different sections, you know, who are looking at all these, this, this, these pressures, you have people like me, who are culturally powerful, who are close, protected, safe, and who are disturbed if there's even one little movement happening here. I mean, one, one really ironic thing is, I wore a lungi. For a person who doesn't know what a lungi is, you know what a sarong is, right? Okay. I wore a sarong for a concert, and that became an issue. I was shocked that that could even be an issue. Why is it an issue? Because it's a question of purity. Why is it an issue? Because Muslims wear it. It's a question of decorum within quotes. That's the level of fear. That's what I'm pointing to. The level of fear that something is being tarnished. Something is being corrupted. And then you have what you could call upwardly mobile art forms, which means upward, upwardly mobile groups of people, where then they move towards a social recognition that they want from the accepted norm, which is the upper norm. And actually, they are the ones that play the right-wing game very, very interestingly, right? So they adapt their art, adapt their culture, adapt their beings to suit what the right-wing hopes. And I must tell you, right-wings have tapped into this community brilliantly, absolutely brilliantly, because they create an aspirational model and say, look, so therefore their art forms also have to be tweaked, Stories have to be changed. Morality has to be brought in. All this happens. And then you have, of course, like I said, communities of Dalits especially, or marginalized, uh, marginalized Muslims, who have their own music, their own dance, their own culture. And here I must again tell you about a month before I came to the States. So we've been looking at this idea of having um, an art festival in what is usually considered a space which is unsafe and you know and that is usually a space where you have the marginalized community living where they live is considered unsafe i mean this is this is what we believe right and where there's rape and where there's drug addiction and we shouldn't be there you know uh, so we were having this discussion with the community in a little suburb called kurkupete anybody who knows chennai may not know kurkupete because Kurukpeta is in the north of Chennai. It's a little suburb, little, little group. They are pretty much bordered on thermal power stations, which just throw fly ash everywhere. There is a excuse of a drain, which is polluted on one side. And the place is absolutely stigmatized in terms of the people there. And we had this in meeting with about 25 young people. It's the best lesson I think we got on democracy and marginalization, on identity, on fighting for one's identity that I've, we ever got from these 25 young people. Because the assertion of identity, the assertion of cultural being, the assertion of art practices that belong here, and the rejection that, who are you to say you have to bring Carnatic music here? I think that was the fabulous question to be asked. And it was a debate that day. One person said, I don't want this Carnatic music. You please bring back to me the art forms that used to be practiced here and that are dying here. 
And then the other person came and said, but unless you've heard it, how can you decide whether you like it or not? So let's figure that out. But what I'm trying to say is that these communities, and Kurukupeta is crazy. You leave, you leave that place on a Saturday night. It's party zone. Music from every street. I mean, there are loudspeakers playing music everywhere. I would, we would call that uncouth, by the way. But it's no, it's a celebration of a space. In all the deprivation that there is in that space, which I, you know, I, let's not romanticize it, right? It is marginalized. It is people you don't see. But there is an assertion of that. And that is a huge thing that is happening in India, I want to point out. That the assertion that is happening from the Dalit community, especially, across India is something very important to this conversation that we are having. And one of the assertions are not just political, they are also cultural assertions of saying, this is my dance, this is my music, this is my body. And I think that's also an important part that we need to recognize when we're speaking about this kind of issues. So what, what do I do as a musician singing Carnatic music? What is my role in challenging what is prevalent? And I must actually say that in spite of all the pushbacks, actually my role is very easy. You know, let's not, I know I probably have done it myself at some level, and I take, I take blame for it. Uh, but portraying this as a big deal sometimes, we have to be careful about. I have to be careful about. Because the pushback I have, I have enough wherewithal, I have enough privilege to handle the pushback. Honestly, I do. So I'm not going to exaggerate it, though I may have also myself in the past, and I'm guilty of it. So this whole idea of the internal and the external is the first important question that I have to ask. So when I sing Carnatic music, what is internal to the music? What is external to the music? What is the essential of the music? What is the padding of the music? How essential is Rama to the music? How unessential is Rama to the music? Does the music die if Rama disappears? Definitely not. But do I discard Rama? Or do I, left, do I complicate Rama? What does dialect do, by, do to my music? And this is where I think the song, there's a song that I sang a few years called the Purambok Kapada. The Purambok, I won't go into the social and the environmental, it was an activist song, it was a song against environmental pollution, it was against the destruction of the commons. Um, it's on YouTube, you can watch it. But I want to just tell you one element of that song, which is the idea of dialect. So most ideas of nationalism use a language which is elite, along with the culture. A certain kind of language, even if you now go, for example, if you go to Karnataka, they will say that Mysore Kannada is the pure Kannada. They've, I've heard this hundred times being told. Now where does this come from? And there is a certain kind of U U UP Hindi, which is a real Hindi, which is a Sanskritized Hindi. In Tamil too, there are these notions. In every language, there are these notions. And it depends on which control group decides on these notions. So. When we did this song, the first thing which is fascinating for me was the language in this song is entirely the language of the common person on the street. Can there be a Carnatic sound that has the sound of the common person on the street? And I'm happy to say that it works. It is possible. So these are, these, these shift a lot of things, perceptions on what can be inside, what can be outside. And you have to go into uh, many more questions of patriarchy, for example. And in this, I want to talk about something that's happening in Carnatic music today as we stand here, which is the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement has, has, has second wave has hit India. And right now, the Carnatic music world is struggling with the Me Too movement. And as it is unfolding, you can also see the unfolding of patriarchy coming very fast and holding on to it. And within that is the same idea of nationalism, the same idea. Of, you can't create an idea of impurity among people who perform this pure form of music, which is the identity of India. You know, it's all saddled together. And therefore, when people push back on this, what you don't realize is it's not, it is, it is a gen and the gender issue is already embedded in this culture. Okay, so you always already have an idea of patriarchy musically, aesthetically, and then you're 
the issue of women being abused is coming up. So if I accept this, I accept everything. The whole, whole box opens. You accept that there has been an aesthetic, social, political, masculine, machismo that has governed the whole idea of this culture. Therefore, you push back everything. And then all the crustiness starts, I mean, it's almost like, I mean, I'm, I'm not trivializing it, don't get me wrong, but it's almost like watching these movies, you know, where you have all the clouds suddenly just coming up and enveloping and just making, it's exactly like, it's fascinating to watch social media. I'm like, wow. And the little things, you know, one small comment here, one small comment there, one small thing there, and then slowly the web start forming and saying, you know, but you know, most, most of the, you know, we don't know about how true these women are, but you know, I have learned from this teacher for the last 50 years, and then dash, 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 dash. And so, one of the things that I have to challenge, if I have to challenge right-wing nationalism, is this very notion of purity. This very notion that there is idea of perfection, a cleansing perfection. And that's one of the challenges to be a Carnatic musician. I'm going to just shift gears a bit here and say another very important aspect is which we have to consider, and this was a learning I had. There's a person called P. Rajagopalan, who's a Kut artist. Uh, kut, some you know, this whole debate about Terukut and Katte Kut, and which should be should be called. Kut is a kind of ritual theater that you find in southern India, which is practiced in temple and on streets. And in one conversation with him, he said something to me. He said it in Tamil, and he said, "For me, art is labor." In Tamil, I'll say it in Tamil. It's far more effective. He said. I would never consider Carnatic music labor. I'm creating knowledge. And that's a, such an important part of this conversation of somebody hijacking you in terms of nationalism. Fundamental to this idea is also deciding what is knowledge and what is not knowledge. It, it shocked me when Rajagopal said this to me. I probably should not shock me, but it did. Because the fact that he's, because in his artistic expression, there was a caste implication, caste obligation involved. The fact that he was, it was a physical, they do it all through the night. The fact that it is a physical labor of dancing all through the night. If I sang all through the night, it's a spiritual experience. If he dances through the night, it's labor. And it's a spiritual experience that's the identity of the country, not the physical experience. A very important aspect of this politics is the, is the division that is made between the spiritual and the physical. And in India, we do it constantly. And it's the spiritual that we seek to make national, not the physical. And if the physical challenges the spiritual, then you have a problem with it. And it should. So I just, so knowledge becomes a very important aspect. So how does, for example, an artist from a marginalized community or performing an art that's ignored? And I must tell you another thing is many of these art forms are not lost. We keep on saying this is lost. Many of these art forms are flourishing in many villages and towns. The very fact that we are saying it's lost itself says something about what we think of them. We, 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 always, we always want to rescue something. We are the saviors, right? We are saving something. But they're actually flourishing. There are hundreds of people listening to it, watching it. But they're not part of my discourse. And I'm just not talking about the media, by the way. It's not the media. But let's also accept that the media is also people like me. So it's a catch-22, right? So we're the same people saying the same things. And it's very fascinating. Even the liberal media is saying the same thing that actually the right-wing media is saying, without saying it actually. So while the liberal, so-called liberal media is battling right-wing politics in terms of very other, every other assertion, what kind of India is the liberal media still discussing? It's the same kind of India. There's a complete contradiction in that. There's an entire concept contradiction in that. And we don't recognize that that's, that is what right-wing politics captures and captures all our imagination into. And what, what is, for example, marginalized community or art forms or cultures do about this? And I think they have to actually use, of course, this is a far more complicated argument, but I'll just give you the surface. I'm sure some people may have a problem with it, but it's good. You can, we can still think about it. Is I think we have to, they have to use the tactics that 
the so called classical did to get themselves legitimacy for example how did bharatanatyam get legitimacy how did kathakali get legitimacy the first thing that we did is we built an institution called kalakshetra and kala mandala we got the government of india to be part of it you institutionalize something you have already given yourself a national identity of being that culture of india every poster will have a bharatanatyam dancer in some angle somewhere of india one of the things i think is important is to is for communities of the marginalized to think of how they can institutionalize the idea not within the parameters that the upper caste did let me let me say it's a very complicated argument but i think it's important to challenge the idea of institution do we may say in india we are guru shishya parampara we are all oral parampara there is an institutionalization of that that we can't deny and there's a legitimacy that happens in the institution so when i go to watch the training of a kutu artist i don't give that institutional respectability or structural respectability to it that i would in a classroom like we did today in the afternoon in the workshop it becomes a serious avenue so how do you create this discourse the whole idea of bringing attention to knowledge creation you have to subvert every mechanism that the people in power used to gain the legitimacy of knowledge is that possible theorization is that possible i think it is possible and i think there are some examples of it already emerging writing about it and we should stop writing about indian arts only in anthropological senses please stop i'm sorry i know this is probably the wrong place to say it, but <laughs> but never i'll tell you why you will do what you will do anyway so i'll tell you why i'm saying it because there is a certain categorization that happens through that by default there's a default categorization if the culture or the art form is already in the position of power it can take this kind of constant narrative because it has the aesthetic social power to handle just a sociological anthropological perception to it but if the art form itself is struggling to gain any kind of recognition within the culture of the country and if you're only going to treat it like an anthropological object or a sociological negotiation where is the art in it where is that we need people writing about the complexities the sophistications we need people creating treatises on these art forms along with this because if we don't we're always going to treat them like some curio objects and we do it i do it so i mean i really feel those are because those are challenges have to be thrown at people like me i have to be challenged in the comfort that i'm sitting now i'm not challenged bluntly put aesthetically i'm not challenged and right wing politics doesn't want to meet me to be challenged it doesn't want a world 50 years from now when nobody cares a damn about hindustani music or carnatic music but why not a world like that why not a world like that course it's i'm speaking absolutely from about utopia but it's good to begin there but the point is that can we change the even the academic institutions have to change the discourse when they talk about lavani or when they talk about these forms the discourse has to change they have to be courses on the sounds of it they have to courses about the movements of it and this has to be done in india and across the globe and these are challenges these will challenge people who believe in the monolithic idea of a country or the idea of nationalism these will challenge them because it will run the they will really be scared if this happens and but this cannot be done by people like me this has to be done by people from the community they have to understand of course enablers are enablers but then the community has to be encouraged to it to do something like this I'll finish in a few minutes, I promise. And two, three things is, what about partnerships? Now, this is something I've worked a bit on, and um, I still don't have much clarity about it. I mean, I, certain things I'm clear about, but certain things are messy. Is 
how do partnerships work? Can we have aesthetic partnership, cultural partnerships that will anyway enable these courses, these courses to be more interesting across artists, across cultural forms, across societies? Yes, ideally seems very important. But they're, they're completely in in a very complicated position because even these partnerships are uneven. They're fundamentally uneven. However equal you may think they are, they're fundamentally uneven. So you have to be constant, constantly conscious that it's an uneven partnership that hopes to change perception. And I must tell you, this is a struggle. It's a huge struggle. Um, because one is what you perceive of it, the other is what is you perceive of it. Sometimes they just don't match. And it disturbs you, oh my goodness, this is what the person's thought of it. The, my power, the power of my colleagues on stage, who may be from a different art form, how does one find a way to create a, not, not the same voice, but a dual voice that kind of makes it a little messy? I'm not yet sure, but I'm convinced that the partnership is important. And I, I, do, I do have a few partnerships that I'm involved in. And I think it's important for the ones who come from a certain privilege control also take the back seat in the partnership and allow it to emerge and just shadow play it at some level. Not in a condescending sense, but sense, but understanding the complexity of who you are and how you control it. Another interesting thing in India is we always talk about art in schools. Especially with music, they'll say, you know, look at the West. They all learn the piano or something. School, they all sing songs or something. I don't know how much this is true, but this is what they usually said, OK? But nobody asked the question, why this music? If I say music in schools in India, everybody's understood it's a classical form. Nobody asked that question in this country, too. Nowhere. Why should it be only classical music that's taught in a school? Or as a primary, I'm not talking about the other things, as a primary idea of music. Why is it always the classical that occupies that space? Why do you always presume it has to be the classical? I can tell you that I myself, uh, have, I, you know, myself, uh, my wife Sangeeta Shilkumar is a musician. Both of us work with five public schools in Chennai, and uh, we teach Carnatic music is taught in those public schools. And uh, we struggle, we think it's important, but at the same time, we think, why only Carnatic music? We have to find a way of getting some other art forms also. The whole idea of what is inside class activity and extracurricular activity, that also defines what is important, what is not important. So when you say art in schools, we have to think deeper about it. In the US, when I was having a conversation now, about three weeks ago in one city, a similar lecture, a person was very disturbed with me saying that many art forms have their own identities and we have to find ways of straddling multiple identities in, in a non-judgmental fashion. So he got up and said, but what do you mean? You know, all these rap songs have all these horrible words in it. They use the four-letter words so often. Are you saying that's the kind of music children should sing? So I said, I'm not talking about children, but if you think, if you think that, that kind of music does not deserve space in society, that's deeply disturbing. That's, that's also a kind of music that deserves a voice and deserves to say what it says. And it also deserves the access that every other form gets, not just in terms of popular culture. Popular culture is not necessarily considered respectable culture. So when people keep on saying that, you know, 15, you know, 10 million people hear this, it doesn't mean even those 10 million people put that above the idea of the classical. No, they don't. Even the people within it, somewhere will say, of course this is popular culture, I love it. But you know what? Only thing, if I go into the film industry, for example, to sing a song, I'll be given special treatment. That's my cast, my gender, of course the fact that I sing Carnatic music. That's all, that's all, that's the only tag. So these are all subconscious behaviors that we have, so we have to challenge this. I just want to conclude by saying that the right wing politics that is there across the globe is only emblematic of how we have built society. It's emblematic of the fact that culturally, aesthetically, and to me that is what we miss, that the segregation of society is aesthetic. It isn't the sound that you hear. It isn't what you see. It isn't the idea of beauty. That's where you're segregating people. And within that is religion, practice, and all this. But what is it? 
it's about your body it's about your movement how do you pray what's your ritual all these are aesthetic bodies we keep talking only in terms of constructions but not in terms of experience right wing politics is about experience it taps into this fundamental idea that you're divisive experientially and unless we recognize that has been the most important part of the way we divide ourselves then there's nothing is going to change which is why the artist and the art form becomes very important because they are the idea of aesthetics and the politics emerges from aesthetics from experience from that deep feeling and we have to muddy deep feelings they have to be messed up because only when you mess it up there's discomfort so when we speak about religious divisions it is not about which god you you pray to it's about everything else but that by the way allah and rama are not the problems there the problem is something else christ is not a problem it's about prayer it is about life it is about food it is about attire it is about color it is about everything else but we keep thinking it's about allah it's not about allah the fear is not allah the fear is the identity of the person which means who is this person geographical region of the person cultural habit of the person so that is why the artist and the art becomes so important because these are avenues of challenging challenging these fundamental divisive notions in an experiential way if i if we as artists can move it a little bit then there is a great possibility of a conversation and i think in this environment that we live in today it's pretty much across the globe let's be honest it is an environment that's across the globe it's important for artists and art forms to rediscover their own self to challenge their own self and to discover within that the ability to shift experience and also to ability to shift their own experience which means you're shifting space you're shifting people you're sp- shifting what you sing or what you play who can play who cannot play and it's important to ask this because otherwise all these discourses become a pro- appropriative course uh, discourses can this be done i think it can i think you don't need a national movement for it because again that's a nationalistic problem we don't need national movements we need multiple small movements small little things happening in little hubs in many places we need hubs of art hubs of cultures hubs of artists on the street on the road on the stage and everywhere asking these questions of experience asking these questions of ritual asking these questions of identity and then i think we have a better way of grappling with right wing politics because let's be very clear it's not going to ever go away thank you very much Thank you.